Hi, welcome along to a little presentation on non-optical telescopes. So that's telescopes that use parts of the electromagnetic spectrum other than um, visible light, the middle of the spectrum. The start of the story is the story of radio astronomy. Um, in a field quite near to where we study, near Cambridge, uh, a man called Anthony Hewish built the world's first radio telescope. And you can see in the background there a picture of it. He literally spent um, over a year filling a field with wooden stakes and bits of wire designed to be a nice large area to collect lots of radio waves from space. Um, and then he had a little shed at the end to process it. It was, of course, an enormous leap of, of faith. Um, it wasn't that the, technologically it wouldn't have been possible up to this point. But of course, until you've built a radio telescope, there's no evidence there's anything coming from space for you to detect. Of course, it turns out that there was plenty to detect, uh, and this young woman called Jocelyn Bell noticed this regularly repeating signal. Um, famously, she wrote in the margin nearby uh, LGM, Little Green Men, uh, because her and Hewish had a couple of weeks where they were really quite certain that they were listening to a signal from aliens. It turned out the reality was perhaps slightly less exciting, but not by much. She'd actually detected um, an object called a pulsar, which is a type of rotating neutron star. Um, and when scientists, uh, when astronomers pointed their optical telescopes in the direction where they said the, the, the radio waves were coming from, they could actually see the object and realise what they were looking at was not an ordinary star, but something very special. This led to a kind of race to build up uh, equipment to look across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it, it, it's quite difficult to observe different parts of the spectrum and we can have a look at the details of the telescopes um, needed to, to um, achieve looking across the spectrum. Now, when we discuss this, it's very important that we're not kind of just thinking about this as a discussion in terms of um, and words and pros and cons. I think that there's solid physics behind everything that we're going to be talking about. The resolution in all but one case, all, all but one area of the electromagnetic spectrum is still given by theta equals lambda over d, the Rayleigh criteria. The collecting power is still determined by d squared and the radiation is also determined by basic physics such as uh, the atmosphere, avoiding interference from human sources of radiation uh, and the ability to see the correct part of the sky. Uh, we also need to be aware of the structure of our various telescopes. Radio telescopes are in, a, in essence a single pixel device. You can point them in one direction and they'll tell you how many how, the amount of radio waves coming from that direction. So they can build up an image but to build up that image um, they would need to scan across. Um, if you can imagine your phone uh, looked in one direction, very narrow direction, and you wanted to um, see if uh, you know, there was a black object on a white background. If you took pictures in enough directions and recorded the direction you took the pictures, you could eventually work out where the black object were. And that's essentially how we take pictures with a, a radio telescope. They do have some similarities you can see here. They've got um, the very large parabolic reflector. Actually, you've got a secondary mirror on this one as, as well to reflect the radio waves back to be detected. Um, radio telescopes are often put near the equator because then they can look both to the north and southern hemisphere, away from cities so that we get minimum uh, interference from man-made radiation. And they can, of course, be on the ground because the atmosphere is very transparent to radio waves. Radio telescopes can be simply enormous. This is a very famous, very large radio telescope in South America, over a kilometre across. Uh, it can't be moved. We just wait for um, the Earth to move um, so that it looks in um, different directions. However, its resolution is still very, very poor indeed, because although uh, in the equation lambda over d, we've now got a very large d, the wavelength of the radiation involved is so huge that we end up with a very poor resolution angle. However, of course, collecting power is um, first rate because the um, diameter and therefore the area or d squared is absolutely huge. Infrared and UV telescopes. Now, these, uh, in essence, are really just optical telescopes. They have the same mirrors. 
um, but they have detectors, CCD chips, tuned with filters and different construction to observe different parts of the spectrum. Because they physically are the same telescope, so for example, the Hubble telescope um, can work in infrared, ultraviolet or visible light. In all parts of the spectrum, it would have exactly the same collecting power because it's obviously the same size mirror. However, um, the shorter the wavelength, the better the resolution. So you can see there that for the same telescope, uh, ultraviolet would have better resolution than visible light. It would have better resolution than infrared light. Infrared telescopes, um, problem that they, they have is that um, the atmosphere has a lot of water in it and infrared radiation is strongly absorbed by water. So we have to locate our telescopes in areas where they'll look through as little water as possible. And, possible, and options are on tops of mountains in dry regions, in planes, as in aeroplanes, as in the picture here, and obviously in space like the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, because the telescope itself will be emitting um, infrared radiation, um, the, the telescope might need to be cooled to prevent the infrared radiation um, created by the actual instrument itself swamping the radiation that we're trying to detect. Ultraviolet telescopes have to be located in space effectively because the atmosphere is so strong at absorbing ultraviolet light. That's a, an enormous benefit to us because um, ultraviolet light is very bad for us. Um, there's a lot of health risks, um, and, but we're shielded from it by an atmosphere that um, absorbs ultraviolet light. And you can see here, I've given, given you a picture of the Hubble Space Telescope that um, absorbs ultraviolet light, no, sorry, records ultraviolet light um, because it's above the atmosphere. X-ray telescopes are the most different of the telescope types. Think about what X-rays are famous for. They're famous for being able to go through things. So it's actually very hard to make an X-ray reflect. It, um, you just used an ordinary mirror in the ordinary way. X-rays will pass through it. So we have to create this onion structure of layered mirrors you can see in the diagram. Um, and the X-rays just reflect by bouncing off at a very shallow angle. But this doesn't create a good image. The rays are not perfectly brought to focus. So the resolution of this telescope is considerably worse than that predicted by theta equals lambda over d, the Rayleigh criteria. That equation gives the absolute um, best resolution possible for that wavelength and diameter. But in this case, we're not able to get anywhere near the theoretical limit. And because these telescopes are, are hard to make, they actually would have many, many layers of mirrors. Uh, we can't make them particularly large, so collecting power is poor as well. X-ray telescopes are located in space simply because the atmosphere is such a strong absorber of X-rays. This slide shows a handy summary of uh, the transparency of the atmosphere. You can see um, actually the atm our atmosphere is very opaque to a very large range of frequencies. And that, that's a lot to our benefit because a lot of those um, frequencies are very harmful. Fortunately, we have a good um, transparency in the atmosphere for visible light and that coincides with the peak uh, wavelength output from the sun which means we you know, get the chance to see um, very well. You can see radio astronomers getting a really good window so radio telescopes and visible telescopes on the ground, x-ray, ultraviolet um, and infrared all really need to be very high in the atmosphere because it's so opaque. We should perhaps give some consideration for what all these different types of telescopes are used for. The simple answer is that um, we use those telescopes to detect objects that emit that particular type of radiation. So if we want to detect objects that give out uh, ultraviolet light, then we need an ultraviolet telescope. However, there are a couple of examples that I think are, are worth knowing. The specification specifically note, mentions that supernova explosions, which um, give rise to uh, black holes and neutron stars at the end of a star's life, um, give out gamma rays, so they would be detected by an X-ray telescope. X-rays and gamma rays are physically the same radiation. And infrared radiation can be used to look through dust towards the center uh, of our galaxy. 